Welcome to Ancient World Studies. My name is Dr. Raoul McLaughlin. My subject is Ancient Interactions Across the Frontiers of the Roman Empire. I have published several books on this subject. St. Patrick is celebrated in Irish tradition as their first bishop and Christian missionary. This lecture reveals the historical Patrick. Firstly, the sources. There are two ancient sources written by a cleric named Patricius, Patrick, that survive into modern times. These are a personal account of his life, known as the Confession, and secondly, a letter he wrote to overseas Christian communities condemning a British warlord named Coroticus who had attacked Irish converts. Both texts are written in Latin the common language used in the Western Roman Empire during the 5th century AD. They were composed about 460 AD, with the author recording that he was elderly at the time of writing. In the Confession, he writes, Now in my old age. And in the letter to Croticus, he refers to a priest whom I have known and taught from his infancy. An early abbreviated version of Patrick's Confession can be found in the 9th century Book of Armagh. This illustrated manuscript is a collection of early church texts written in medieval Latin and Old Irish on vellum, calfskin parchment. The manuscript is one of the oldest documents in Irish history and preserves transcribed copies of much earlier texts. It includes translations from the New Testament and accounts of the Irish past gathered from respected traditions. It was assembled at Armagh in Ulster during an era when this site was a leading ecclesiastical community in Ireland. The manuscript is a national treasure, currently on display in the library of Trinity College Dublin, where the Book of Kells is also kept. Six hundred and copies of Patrick's Confession are preserved in medieval manuscripts held in British and Continental collections. These counterparts verify the contents of the original work and help to confirm the full text of this important document. They reveal that the authorities in Armagh omitted passages in the Confession where Patrick expressed his vulnerability. Patrick's other surviving text, The Letter to the Soldiers of Caroticus, is present in five British and Continental manuscript collections but not in Armagh. Perhaps the church authorities in Ireland omitted this document because it presented Patrick as a leader who had not protected the early Christian community from external threat. Alternatively, the letter was written to inform overseas authorities about the actions of a renegade British warlord. Consequently, it might not have been relevant to early Irish records. The earliest Irish accounts of Patrick rely on a lost work written by an abbot named Ulton, who died in 656 AD. One of Ulton's followers, a church scholar named Tertian, used this narrative to write a life of Patrick in Latin, which is preserved in the Book of Armagh. Another monastic scholar named Mercu wrote a life of Patrick in about 700 AD. These accounts were written more than two centuries after Patrick's mission to Ireland and contain many embellishments and stories from popular folklore and miracle tales. These medieval texts provide location clues from place names and long-standing traditions, but most of their content cannot be historically authenticated. What do we know about the life of Patrick? The writer calls himself Patricius, but he was probably known to Roman society as Palladius. The Latin title, Patrician, identified the aristocratic elite. But by late antiquity, Patrician was also a rank assigned to senior office holders in Roman government, and the name Patricius was given to youths from aspirational noble families. Perhaps this is the origin of the name adopted by Palladius. However, writing much later, Tertian refers to Patrick 
as Patricius, father of the citizens. This suggests the name could originate from the Latin Peter, father, designating the head of a family or household community. The title Patriarch was also a senior position in the early church, acknowledged at the First Council of Nicaea. Churchmen generally had to have reached the age of 50 before being appointed bishop, so Patrick, Palladius, was probably born about 381 AD. In this era, the Roman Empire was struggling to suppress military uprisings and contain foreign invaders who were crossing the imperial frontiers. Roman Britain was threatened by seaborne Irish raiders who could make landfall anywhere along the poorly defended western coast. These Irish warbands were deterred and then defeated by Roman military action. Prosper Taro reports that in 383 AD, the Roman commander in Britain, Magnus Maximus, defeated raiding Irish and Picts. Peace was probably secured by the Romans making payments to the Irish in order to deter further attacks. The bankrupt Roman state collected and confiscated household silverware to pay its troops and bribe foreign powers. Evidence comes from Roman silver hoards found in Ireland. This includes the Baleen find from County Limerick and the Colrean hoard discovered on the north coast. The Colrean hoard contains Roman coins and silver ingots. The silver ingots are marked with official stamps bearing the initials of state-approved Roman workshops. One of the ingots from the Colrean hoard was stamped with the inscription from the workshop of the patrician. A further stamp from one of the Baleen ingots bore the Cairo Christian symbol indicating the influence of the religion among state authorities in Britain. Both hoards contained pieces of silver dining ware that had been cut into carefully measured weights by imperial officials. Patrick, as he later became known, records that he was born near the Vicus Banavem Tabernae, which was probably the Romano-British town of Banaventa. Banaventa was in central Britain, close to a major Roman thoroughfare known today as Watling Street. The Tabernae in the title might have been a collection of taverns, Tabernae, near Banaventa, which provided rest and provisions for travellers using the busy Watling Street Highway. It was near modern Norton in North Hampshire, about 50 miles north of Oxford. Watling Street was a paved highway leading from Dubris, Dover in Kent, passing Londinium, then westward to Rochester. There the road divided with one branch heading to the major port town of Diva on the River Dee, Chester, and the other continuing to the Lynn Peninsula opposite Anglesey. Consequently, this road was the most direct route from the Irish Sea into the economic and political core of Roman Britain. The countryside contained wealthy Roman farming estates known as villas, which were organised around large country manors modelled on luxurious Italian houses. The villas were operated by large communities of slaves engaged in agricultural labour or specialised domestic service. The estates were owned by a class of political elites who held office in nearby city councils and undertook important civic duties. By this era, the Roman Empire was mostly a Christian society. The Emperor Constantine I had established Christianity as a state-approved religion in 313 AD and was himself fully converted shortly before his death in 337 AD. However, some members of the Roman aristocracy promoted classical paganism. The Emperor Julian, who came to power in 360 AD, was an apostate who renounced Christianity in favour of a pagan philosophy called Neoplatonism. The Praetorian Prefect, Praetextatus, was a prominent advocate of paganism, but retained his senior position at the imperial court 
until his death in 384 AD. By 392 AD, the Emperor Theodosius was enforcing decrees to outlaw public pagan practices, but promoters of the old traditions remained in office. Another leading Roman statesman, office holder and orator, named Quintus Aurelius Symmachus, advocated paganism until his death sometime after 402 AD. Consequently, Patrick grew up in a society where pagan practices were still being promoted by influential people. Patrick records that his father, Calpornius, was a church deacon and a decurion, town councillor, and his grandfather, Potitus, was a priest in Banaventa. Despite this family background, Patrick says that he showed limited interest in Christianity during his youth, and aged 15 may have participated in a pagan practice, perhaps offering a pledge to a traditional Roman deity. In later life, this unspecified act was used by his opponents to challenge his appointment as bishop. Patrick refers to this in his confession as Some things I had done one day, rather in one hour, when I was young. The Irish were still under treaty in 393 AD, and in that year, Symmachus was able to display seven Irish wolfhounds to an astonished population in Rome. They might have been a gift to Roman authorities from Irish chiefs who had formed temporary alliances. Symmachus reports that, On the prelude day, the presentation of Irish dogs so astonished Rome that it was assumed that they were brought in iron cages. In the games that followed, the Irish hounds may have fought wolves in the Roman arena. Britain was peaceful in 396 AD. A senior Roman general named Stilacho travelled to the Rhine region to recruit new troops, and Britain did not require his interest or attention. That same year, when Patrick was 15 years old, a Gallic bishop named Victricus visited Britain to settle a dispute between church leaders on the island. Victricus was a former legionary who had endured floggings and the threat of execution when he renounced his military service to pursue a career in the church. As an evangelist, he had conducted missionary ventures on the Rhine frontiers to convert people on the edge of empire. In recognition for these achievements, he was appointed Bishop of Rouen in northern Gaul. As Victricus visited the main cities in Britain, he would have travelled along the Watling Street Highway to Chester. Patrick and his father may be travelled to hear the bishop speak about missionary journeys on the Rhine frontier. The following year the Irish attacked. The court port Claudian describes how The Irish roused all Ireland and the sea foamed with hostile oars as Britain succumbed to the neighbouring tribes. This suggests major incursions and thousands of Irish warriors might have participated in the attacks. The Irish warbands bypassed the understrength Roman garrisons barricaded in their walled towns, and advanced en masse towards the inland country estates, where they could pillage the largely undefended villas of the British elite. Banaventa was 120 miles from the Irish Sea, or about six days' travel at a determined walking pace. This was not a great distance, and the evidence confirms that during this period of conflict, Irish incursions penetrated far into Roman Britain. Evidence comes from Rochester, which is about 50 miles inland from Chester. There, archaeologists find a Latinized Irish text cut into the fragment of a Roman monument. Written in Roman capitals, the text honours an Irishman called the Hound King. Patrick confirms that he was 16 years old when the Irish attacked the family villa and took him captive along with many thousands of other Roman subjects and slaves. Patrick was not with his parents when this raid took place. Banaventa was a fortified town and his father and grandfather were safe at their urban residences 
when the attack occurred. He reports, I was taken prisoner near Banaventa. I was about 16 at the time. I was taken into captivity in Ireland, along with thousands of others. In his letter to Caroticus, Patrick confirms that the Irish killed both male and females in his household, probably those who fought back or had little value as slaves. The Irish did not distinguish between estate slaves and aristocratic youths, so the young man was rounded up with his former servants and marched to the coast where Irish ships were waiting to carry trophies and captives back to Ireland. The Roman general Stilacho sent a campaign force to Britain to rally the Roman garrisons and repel the Irish assault. After the conflict, the Roman units in Britain were permanently reinforced by a small field army consisting of several thousand soldiers, including a legion. By 400 AD, the conflict was concluded, and Claudian claims that due to this intervention, Britain no longer fears the spears of the Irish. However, the Britons seized during raids remained in Ireland as long-term captives with little prospect of returning to their former lives and positions within Roman society. Patrick in Ireland One of the landing sites for the returning Irish raiders was Dundrum Bay in County Down. Roman signet rings and part of a military belt buckle were recently found there, in the sand dunes of Murloc Beach, close to the Mourne Mountains. Perhaps these items were dropped and lost in the sand by Irish warbands coming ashore laden with loot and captives. Patrick explains that he was sold as a slave to an Irish master who put him to work in a rural setting. Relying on later traditions, Turchin claims that Patrick was a shepherd on Slemish Mountain in County Antrim. Patrick had to protect his flock from thieves, brigands, and natural predators, including wolves. Long periods of isolation gave him the opportunity to develop his strong Christian faith. Work as a shepherd was appropriate, due to the many New Testament references to this task. Patrick would have become familiar with the harsher sounding Celtic dialect spoken in Ireland. He writes, I remained in the woods and on the mountain. I would rise to pray before dawn, in the snow, the ice, in the rain. I never felt the worse for it. I never felt slothful. As I realize now, the spirit was burning in me at that time. Six years later, when he was 22 years old, Patrick had an opportunity to return to Britain. In early 402 AD, the Romans removed important military units from Britain to help defend Italy from a Gothic invasion. Claudian confirms that when the Roman army assembled for the Battle of Palantia, it included the legion protecting distant Britain, which restrains the fierce Irish. The withdrawal of these military units meant that the Irish could now cross into Britain. Consequently, Irish adventurers and war chiefs gathered their forces for new expeditions. Patrick realised that this was his chance to escape, and he describes how he received a message from God, informing him that his opportunity was coming. He writes, It was there one night in my sleep that I heard a voice saying to me, You have fasted well, very soon you will return to your native country. His departure and travel overland occurred at a time when men from all across Ireland were heading to the ports, so consequently he could evade notice and possible recapture. Patrick had to seek embarkation for Britain in some distant territory where he would not be easily recognised as a runaway slave. He writes, I heard someone saying to me, Look, your ship is ready. But it was not nearby. It was a good 200 miles away. I had never been to the place, nor did I know anyone there. 
He travelled cross country from Antrim to a site two hundred miles away near Wexford, marked on Roman maps as Menapea. This port offered a more direct seaborne route to his former home at Banaventa in southern Britain. Roman ships from Gaul and Britain were visiting Ireland during this period, trading goods at coastal enclaves under the protection of local warlords. Some of these trade vessels would have been prepared to transfer Irish passengers to Roman Britain. Patrick approached one of these captains and requested passage across to Britain, but he was refused. He reports, The day I arrived, the ship was about to leave the place. I said I needed to set sail with them, but the captain was not pleased. He replied unpleasantly and angrily, No, and don't try to come with us. However, certain Irishmen had secured passage on the ship, and they insisted that the youth should be allowed to accompany them. Patrick writes, I heard someone shout at me, Come quickly, those men are calling you. I turned back right away, and they began to say to me, Come on, we'll trust you. Prove you're our friend in any way you want to. The Irish group described by Patrick resembled a war band, sailing with a pack of hunting dogs. Consequently, they were happy enough to add another recruit to their company. A relatively small 75-ton cargo ship could transport up to 30 passengers on its deck, but the captain of the vessel did not take his passengers to the nearest Roman port. This is significant because the Roman state regulated seaborne commerce. Merchants had to offload their cargoes at designated ports, where foreign goods were subject to special import taxes. Traders brought their goods to these lawful ports because they wanted to avoid costly fines and confiscations. But the system also had important benefits, because market centres attracted buyers who competed to purchase stock. To facilitate these deals, Roman authorities organised dockside auctions for incoming cargoes. Consequently, commodities sold in ports could obtain the highest prices. Patrick records that it was a three-day crossing to Britain, and his group came ashore somewhere remote from roads, forts and major settlements. This was probably to avoid hostile attention from the Roman military. The landing site could have been in northwest Wales. A later Irish presence in the Lynn Peninsula is confirmed by the discovery of Ogham stones, Irish territorial markers to commemorate champions and chiefs. Patrick describes a four-week trek through wilderness terrain. This is often interpreted by churchmen as a biblical metaphor, but this would describe the invasion activities of an Irish warband. An influential churchman named Jerome heard stories about similar Irish raiders when he was a young man living in Trier. These stories were spread by Roman soldiers serving in Gaul. They reported that Irish scouting parties would head inland and ambush shepherds and attack isolated farmsteads. They would cut trophies from their victims and leave the bodies mauled and mutilated by their fierce dogs. This encouraged rumours that the Irish raiders were themselves cannibals. Patrick continued to travel with the raiders as they avoided patrols and moved through the marginal lands towards the core of the Roman province. Patrick reports, For 28 days we travelled through a wilderness until our food ran out, and there was no sign of us finding people anywhere. When the group discovered a herd of pigs, Patrick interpreted this as an answer to prayer. He explains that they killed many of the pigs and remained there for two nights until they were fully restored and the dogs were recovered as well. On another occasion, the group found wild honey, but one of the Irishmen declared it as an offering to his pagan gods. Patrick therefore refused to consume his share of this food. It was a journey of 160 miles from the Lynn Peninsula across mountainous Snowdonia to reach the Roman town of Varaconium, Rochester. 
But Patrick and his group were travelling a less direct route, with more distant objectives, and many pauses between treks. Patrick does not explain how this venture with his Irish companions ended, but possibly he was taken into custody by local militia or was intercepted by a Roman patrol. He writes, It happened that I was taken prisoner again. Patrick refers to a two-month period when he was held in captivity before he escaped again with some of his companions. He writes, On the sixtieth night, the Lord freed me from my captors. On this journey, the Lord provided food and fire and shelter every day, until on the tenth day we met some people. These events occurred in a period of crisis for the wider Roman Empire. In 406 AD, Germanic peoples overran the Rhine frontiers and devastated large parts of Gaul a general named Constantine, gathered the Roman soldiers in Britain and led them across the channel to restore order. But he declared himself co-emperor, provoking a vicious civil war. His armies were defeated by supporters of the Emperor Honorius in 409 AD. A year later, the provincial cities of Britain were instructed to organise their own defence using locally raised militia. That same year, the Visigoths sacked Rome. The personal events mentioned by Patrick are obscured by a deliberate lack of information, and he concludes with the statement, A few years later, I was again with my parents in Britain. Patrick remained with his family for some time in Banaventa. He explains that, My family pleaded with me that, After all the many tribulations I had undergone, I should never leave them again. However, one night he experienced a dream that was to change his destiny. In his dream, Patrick saw Bishop Victricus, the missionary he had heard in his youth. Victricus was carrying letters of entreaty from the most distant locations in Ireland. Patrick describes how he had a vision in the night, where the man whose name was Victricus, Victoricus, was coming apparently from Ireland, with so many letters they could not be counted. He gave me one of these. It was the voice of the Irish people. While I was reading out the beginning of the letter, I thought I heard at that moment the voice of those who were beside the wood of Vauclot, near the western sea, They called out with one voice, We beg you, holy youth, to come and walk among us again. Tertian records a 6th century Irish tradition that the wood of Vaucloth was in Connacht. By establishing a Christian community in this territory, Patrick could claim to have evangelised across the entire island. Victricus had demonstrated how to conduct missionary activities in non-Roman territory. But before Patrick could fulfil this aim, he had to obtain a recognised position in the church to validate and support his mission. He therefore left Britain for religious training in Gaul. It was almost three decades before an opportunity came for Patrick to return to Ireland. In 429 AD, a bishop in Gaul named Germanus received a request from churchmen in Britain. They asked him for assistance in refuting a radical Christian creed called Pelagianism, which was gaining influence in their church communities. Jerome suggested in his writings that Pelagianism might have an Irish origin. Germanus was a former provincial commander who had been trained in Roman civil law. He therefore accepted the request and prepared a team of churchmen for an expedition to Britain. Before embarking, he sought papal permission and support for his endeavour. By this stage, Patrick, or Palladius as he was known, was a deacon in the Gallic Church. As a native Briton, Patrick was an important advocate when Germanus made his request to papal authorities in Italy. 
Prosper of Aquitaine reports. At the insistence of the deacon Palladius, Pope Celestine sends Germanus, Bishop of Auxerre, as his representative to root out heresy and direct the Bretons to the established faith. The proposal was accepted by papal authorities and the expedition prepared. The suggestion that Pelagianism had an Irish connection allowed Patrick to argue for a supplementary Christian mission to Ireland itself. By this stage, there were enough Christians in Ireland to justify the dispatch of a bishop to the island, and Patrick was selected for this position. He was a logical choice, given his direct experience of Irish society, culture, and most importantly, language. Patrick could now return to Ireland with the benefit of church finances and a support staff of specially selected priests and clergy. Prosper of Aquitaine makes an entry for 431 AD to record that Palladius was consecrated by Pope Celestine and sent to the Irish who believed in Christ as their first bishop. Now, aged 50, Patrick prepared to return to the country of his former captivity. This much is known from the ancient evidence. These are the historical facts. This is the real Patrick. Thank you for your attention.